My name is Harold Pearson. I am an alcoholic. That thing got a camera on it, uh, Chris. Huh? <laughs> that thing is. That's in the back. Uh, okay. I just just want to make sure. And it does censor, right? Uh, okay. Good. Uh, tell you what, y'all get through the readings pretty quick here. I, I was sitting there thinking about what I needed to say up here, and uh, and then the next thing I know, here Brad is, and he said a few kind words. I appreciate that, Brad. I said, doggone, I. I don't even know where I need to get up there after that. But uh, anyway, as he said, God is good. God, I have been greatly blessed. I have been greatly blessed by uh, a God that I don't understand, but a God I have a relationship with today, a God that I've experienced time after time after time in my life. And most times when I experience it, I don't realize it. But on down the road, whether it's a, maybe a few hours, a few days, or a few weeks, I realize that... Uh, that something's happened, and it uh, was beyond anything that I could have brought about or probably any other human being. And, and I know God uses other human beings in our lives to bring about uh, change and things like that. But I am, I, I am deeply grateful to be here tonight. And I was, I was told Rad right before I got up here, looked around it, and gosh knows it's very unusual to go to a uh, meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and probably as many females in the room as there is males. And I mean, I don't know if that's true here tonight, but sort of looks like it. And I think that's great. It's, uh, and uh, you know, I always have a great appreciation for this uh, primary purpose group. Uh, um, and uh, let me say this: I'm still a uh, part of Samaritan Colony, and as a result of that, I'd like to say thank you to ones of you that, uh, well, for all of you members of the primary purpose, because I know you do support the ones that come down there on Friday nights and or every other Friday night and carry a message and. And also, uh, you know, a lot of times you probably don't get to uh, get a lot of accolades or get uh, feedback or anything, but we get a lot of feedback from people that uh, that um, were in the detox. Where you, uh, you know, what three times a week I think you go to the detoxes, and and like I say, you probably don't uh, get accolades or don't hear the things, but we hear it that that somebody said something that. Uh, move them towards a willingness to go to treatment. Maybe they decided, they were, you know, we're not going to go. They're just going to do whatever you do in detox and, and get over there and go back home. And, and we know usually what happens if you do that. But but anyway, uh, they say that so-and-so uh, made a comment or because somebody from primary purpose, uh, uh, you know, said something. And, and so uh, thank you for that, uh, you know, and, and for all the service you do. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, again, this is a special. I was up here, what, a couple months ago? It was in February, Wallace, when you all picked your... And, and I remember that night, you talk talking about spiritual awakening and spiritual experiences and experiences. Being up here that night, uh, I mean, not being not up here, but back there about midways, and, and and as Wallace, when he picked up his 50-year chip that night, made the comment that... Uh, that very seldom you, you be in a room where at least, I think it's four people that night, four people that had 50 years or more of recovery. And, and I was grateful to be up here that night and be able to, uh, to uh, be able to experience that. Uh, my home group, as Brad made uh, mention to, uh, we met last night. We meet on uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, we just changed to 7 o'clock. Uh, I sort of like that uh, here, here a while back, uh, a few probably six weeks ago, I guess, but uh, we don't seven o'clock at Wednesday night. It's a closed uh, discussion meeting. Also, we picked up the uh, uh, Rockingham or the uh, Sunday night meeting that had uh, used to be going under the name of the original Rockingham group. And, uh, and for so many years, it got dropped a couple years ago uh, this coming July, and we picked it up this uh, past September. It was two years ago, so we always have also had that under our uh, belt now, or, or part of the uh, old time structure group. And that's on Sunday night at seven o'clock, also. So, if you're ever in that uh, that area, we welcome you there. Uh, <clears throat> my sobriety date is uh, is uh, February 21st, uh, 1980, 1981, and um, I, you know, I, I didn't intend for that. I, it happened, and. Uh, I was introduced to program Alcoholics Anonymous uh, several years before that. Maybe I'll get around to talking about that tonight. But anyway, uh, I have a uh, sponsor, and, and uh, he has a sponsor. And matter of fact, he's got two sponsors, of course. Uh, he needs it. Uh, but uh, 
And I do have a few sparrows that are uh, flying around that I, I try to work with. Uh, I've never never been much in much in sponsorship, and and I, and I used to do, do it. And I say, yeah, it was just an excuse, and uh, that you know, working in, in treatment a lot of times that you certainly didn't need to you know, ethically, you didn't need to uh, sponsor people you would uh, or work with in a treatment facility. But uh, but it, and I have pretty good success with uh, guys that have been around for quite some time and had a good sponsor, you know. And get them a good point, and whatever happens, their sponsor move, or and, and God forbid, their sponsor dies, or you know, or whatever, and and they need somebody, and, and I can do pretty good with them, uh, you know, because it's just uh, just to carry on. But I do have one that uh, uh, will be uh, come um, July that I've had from the get go, and uh, and some of you uh, do know Black Mac, and uh, and what brings it to mind was he spoke for Sunday night. And he and I was working together in the uh, garden this afternoon, and so, uh, so uh, he's uh, like I say, he'll have 30 years in uh, in July, and so, uh, so it's been been a uh, especially early on with Mac because he was one that you know when he needed to see you, he was going to see you. It didn't matter where you were at, what you were doing, or whatever, he was priority, and uh, and he used to irritate me some, but to, but as. Uh, as time went on, I had a great appreciation for it because you know his sobriety was important, and and, uh, and he said Sunday night, and he he, he said that I hadn't even thought anything about it, but he called me one morning about a week and a half ago, six o'clock in the morning. Of course, I was up, but uh, and he was telling me about that he had, he had went to get a drink out of a cooler that afternoon, and. Uh, uh, right next to the uh, drink that he got was uh, Mad Dog wine. And he's, he said, Bub, I didn't realize it had so many colors of it now. <laughs> and he said, I just stood there and looked, you know. <laughs> and he said, I looked. And he said, I got to thinking about that. And he said, all afternoon it was on my mind. And he said, well, I thought it would be, you know, gone, uh, you know, during the night. And he said, and I woke up this morning, it's still on my mind. So he said, that's what I'm calling, calling about. And I said, well, at least you're telling on your disease, Mac. And I said, but I think you just need to pray about it. And uh, anyway, he, he certainly was able to do that. But uh, but he talked about Sunday night, the power of the addiction, and how a lot of times we think, you know, you're beyond those, you don't, you, you shouldn't be thinking about it or anything else. And uh, I can relate well. I uh, live in a rural area, and I'm going to cut my grass in the summertime, pick up in the ditch uh, from the house. And a lot of times I pick up, uh, I say a lot of times, quite frequently these. Uh, Smearing off uh, ice, I believe what it is, uh, uh, bottles, and and I understand that's wine cooler or something, but I and that was it was my, I say my drink. We wasn't smearing off ice, cause it wasn't a smearing off ice back then, but uh, but a blue label, blue label smearing off. That's what I, if I could get it, that's what I wanted. Uh, when I uh, finally got to the program. Uh, was my drink of choice, Hunter Poo smearing off. But but anyway, I'd pick those bottles up and look at them. I think it says 15% alcohol or something like that. And just, you know, and I put it in a bag or whatever and go on about my business. But I do, you know, think about it when I look at it and I get to thinking, hey, I, you know, I don't know, but I do know. I, I, I know. <laughs> so I understand, you know, uh, that uh, I've got this addictive mind and it'll always be with me. I, I believe that. But uh, anyway, uh, the disease of alcoholism had control of my life long before I ever put alcohol in my body. Uh, I probably needed it. I probably needed it at an early age. Uh, but you know, our textbook talks about that we were like the actor on stage forever trying to arrange the lights to ballet the scenery and rest the players in the wrong way. And that was constantly what I was doing at that early age. I didn't realize that, I mean, you know, uh, uh, that uh, I was irritable, I was restless, I was discontented. I had got a, I was adopted, I had a name change, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I didn't understand that. I didn't, well, I, I understood it, I understood it. In, in, I was sort of adopted into the own, my, in, stayed in the family, but I had a name change. And uh, basically what happened was my aunt, my biological father's sister, Adopted me because my biological mother died when I was two and a half years old, and my biolog biological father was uh, 
was an alcoholic and she, uh, my mother had insight in, in knowing that he probably could not care for me and asked this, asked this lady, uh, uh, my biological father's sister to, uh, to take me. Didn't say adopt me and they elected to adopt me. And as a result of that, I had a name change. And, uh, and so I was raised up in a home where there was no alcohol. And it really was a great, great childhood. And I, uh, if you'd asked me then, and, and outwardly, I'd probably look pretty normal. Uh, and small, well, I lived out three miles out in the country, but uh, the community where I was, uh, went to school, uh, went to church, uh, uh, anything you did, uh, you did it there in a little old community of Gibson in Scotland County, right on the South Carolina line. But I lived in North Carolina, and 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 the the community of Gibson, where the school and all that was, was in North Carolina. But the quickest way to my home, where I lived, three miles out of nowhere, uh, was to go through South Carolina. And at an early age, I decided that I would probably drink, and I didn't know what drinking was at that time. Uh, I was in the third grade of school when we got our first uh, TV, and I can remember well, it was in March of 1957. I knew it was on a Saturday because I had the opportunity to watch Carolina beat uh, Kansas in tri triple overtime that night as they, uh, they uh, beat, uh, like I say, beat Kansas, Wilt Chamberlain and the Kansas team in triple overtime that night, uh, went 32-0 and 0 that year. So I do know it was in 19, 1957 when we got a, a TV, so I didn't know what I didn't know what drinking was. I didn't know what shooting pool was, but those places in South Carolina, especially on Friday nights and Saturday night, when we would ride by there, you know, there's always a big crowd out there. And a lot of times, one of them had a, a paved parking lot, and one of them had an old clay dirt parking lot, and they were beer joints. One of them was called a wine house. I mean, you know. Um, but sometimes people would be out there doing donuts. And I mean, at that early age, five, six years old, that was exciting. And uh, my mother would talk about, you know, the evils that were going on there. And again, I didn't know what drinking was. I, I, knew my, I knew my father, my biological father was alcoholic. I knew him, I'd seen him drunk. But I really didn't understand, uh, you know, that you shouldn't drink or things such as this. Or I, you know, I thought some people were drunks and maybe I drank. But that, those, driving those cars, I'd see them leave there sometimes just peeling rubber, you know, smoking tires. I like that. Sometimes on Sunday morning we'd be going back to church and there'd be one turnover out in the ditch. <laughs> uh, you know, back then uh, you took care of your own. You didn't have record services and, and, and things such as that. And that was exciting to me. And I, I probably, I'm, I'm sure that I knew at that time one day I'm going to go to those places. I'm going to do some of that pool shooting. I'm going to do some of that beer drinking, that wine drinking, whatever. I'm going to find out about it. And ultimately, and, and I did. Believe you me, I did. I never at that time said, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to spend enough money at those places in a few years probably to buy one of them. Or I would be going to be asked to leave. Or uh, they'd prefer I don't come back. Uh, or I would be found passed out behind the place under a tree back there. And you know, I never, never entertained any of that thought. I was just going to, I wanted to see about driving those cars and things such as that. And I could stand here tonight and tell you all kind of tales of things that's, that happened at those places in, in, in there. But that was just trying to get out into where I live back in North Carolina, three miles from nowhere. And, uh, at that early age, I had, I, I, like I say, I was irritable, restless, discontented. I didn't like, I didn't like circumstances. I didn't like these people that had eventually adopted me were old enough to be my grandparents. I thought they were old fogies. They didn't understand, or uh, you know that. Uh, I, naturally, I could see at school my other classmates or a lot of my classmates, you know, had parents that were much younger than my parents. But see, what I didn't see was some of those kids didn't even have parents or didn't have. The father wasn't in the home. They didn't have what I had. I didn't see any of that. All I saw was what, you know, that I thought I had more than what I had. And, and that's sort of the way my life was. I always looked at what I didn't have. When I never looked at what I did have or looked at the people that had less than, always looked at who had more than. And so I was forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players on the way. And I was thinking today, you know, that little old small school, probably 400 enrollment, that's grades, you know, 
one, they didn't have kindergarten, <clears throat> one through 12, you know, two buildings. And then they had a gymnasium, they had a, they had a shop building, they had a cafeteria, but two buildings that classrooms. And you go in first grade over here, and if you do well in 12 years, you get out the other one, that's 12 years. And uh, like I say, probably enrolled with a 400 total. And, and you know, in that small environment, you gotta be pretty good to get away with stuff and not get back to your mother. Now back in those days, you got beat at school, you got it when you came home, if they found out about it. I had a, I had an aunt who was a school teacher, fourth grade school teacher, old maid school teacher, you know. And, and I was able to pull stuff off of that school and keep her from knowing it where my mother didn't. I, now believe you me, there were some times my mother found out about it. Now you better believe I took some whippings. Thank God, because if I hadn't, if she hadn't been as, as strict and as firm as what she was, I would have uh, never, you know, I'd have been in prison by the time I was 18, probably. But anyway, it, this is sort of the way it was. And, and out there in the middle of nowhere, all the things, the devious things, the lying, and, and a lot of it, no reason to lie, is that, you know, uh, Dr. Silworth says, that's why we can't differentiate the truth from the false. That's early on in my life. You know, I just lie there, you know. Uh, my mother, and I don't think she made that statement. And I don't know if, if any lawyers in here, I hope I don't offend you, but, 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 but I, she, she made a statement. She said, you would make a good lawyer. And I, you know, that, that was, you know, I, I don't know how old, but she said, because you lie so much. <laughs> and, and I don't know if she really knew that I was lying as much as I was lying. <laughs> and, and, and things such as that. But, uh, but anyway, Keeping all that hid from her. So by the time alcohol became part of my life, if someone had stopped me and said, look, you need to do a fourth and fifth step. Because I had enough uncomfortableness in me that if it would have cleaned me, you know, and I got it cleaned down, I think that's what a fourth and fifth step does is clean us out internally, that I probably would have not... I, I wouldn't have had to do all that drinking. It would have saved me a lot of money and everything because once I started drinking, it was pretty well blackout drinking. And by the time I got to this program and did a fourth and fifth step, it, most of the, the stuff that I remember was before I ever drank. So if I could have went ahead and did it at 14, 15 years old, you know, that would have probably simplified a lot of things. But I started drinking and, 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 uh, and that's like I say, it was out of control. I didn't stay drunk every day, I, you know, I just, uh, but I drank as often as I could whenever I got a chance. And again, I'm keeping this hid from my mother, and you got to remember, a small community. By this time, uh, my adopted father's dead. He died when I was 13. I didn't do well with parents. All of them gone by the, two sets by the time I'm 20 years old. But, uh, but anyway, nobody, me and my mother, and I'm trying to keep this hid. And I'm still trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in my own way. I've got this doctor that my mother worked for. She was a nurse, and, and he had tried to take over as a father figure. And, and uh, after my uh, adopted father died, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Gibson's dead now, and I was able to make amends to him before he died and, and help him with some people and so forth. But, but he, you know, he, he didn't understand what was going on with me. And I, I think he finally, Finally, you know, says, you know, if you're going to drink, just drink. I mean, we're, we're not going to participate in it no more. And this was the time I would got out of the Air Force and was working for him on the farm before I got fixing to get fired. But, but anyway, uh, opportunities, you know, educational opportunities that he was going to give to me, uh, other career opportunities that he talked to me about. But all I could do was focus on, you know, drinking liquor. And I'd been in the Air Force. I'd got out of the Air Force. Because uh, on a hardship discharge, because this uh, this biological mother, I mean the uh, adopted mother, she was terminal cancer, and she was the only parent I had left, and uh, I came home to try to be of service to her or try to help her, and and literally, you know, uh, this was in November of '68. She died in March of '69, and y'all know I was I couldn't I couldn't do anything other than uh, I, yeah I started drinking and I, I just uh, drunken. Uh, Tirades at home, uh, profanities rolling out of my mouth. Uh, got a first DWI during that time period, uh, and all. And so she finally came to the realization that her son was, you know, that the, what she had heard that she didn't believe 
uh, when I was in high school. She couldn't find out it was the truth about me, you know, and, and so forth. And, and I, want, I didn't want to be that way. She died, uh, well, the night before she died, the next morning, I went, went home that afternoon to change clothes, go back to the hospital and be of, uh, you know, because we knew it was a matter of time. But I stopped to get a beer. And you all know what happened. I, uh, <clears throat> next thing I know, I was back at the hospital in a blackout. I don't remember this. They got me out of the hospital and, and, and got me home. And, and of course, the next morning, I was, you know, she died before I got back up to the hospital. You know, a lot of guilt and shame, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and, and, and during the time of the funeral, you know, every time people looked and they were standing talking, I knew that was probably what they was talking about and all this kind of stuff. And later on, I didn't want to tell nobody this on fifth step. I didn't want nobody to know that, you know. And, and the insanity, you know, people knew, by God, they'd seen it, they'd been part of it and, and all this. But but time rolled on and, and, and this farm I was working on for this doctor, I was going to get fired and... and uh, and I mean, they hadn't talked about firing me. They, they talked about a lot of different things. They talked about putting me on antibodies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I told them I wouldn't take it. Well, they said, we know that, but we're going to put it, you know, we're going to give it to you and watch you take it. And I thought, yeah, and you know, I'll go around and behind the building and spit it out. But I would, you know, and they talked to me about being an alcoholic. I said, no, you know, I, I drank, I, you know, I liked a few beers when I got off work. And they said, that's understandable. But said, a lot of people like a few beers, but, uh, but, uh, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're not still, you know, drinking. And, and they show up for work, and they, they are responsible in things such as this. But uh, anyway, I knew I was, they were, my uh, time was running out with them, so I quit, quit them before I got fired. Uh, went in construction work, and, and that was a paradise for a while. Uh, I, was, I was young enough to, you know, do the deal and, and uh, get up the next morning go to work and, and all this kind of thing. A lot of times you get in... We worked out of town all the time, so I'd get in back motel by time enough to uh, change clothes and, and hit, get to work again. And y'all know how it is at three, three or four o'clock in the morning all day. I ain't, and I'm not going to do it. But three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you sort of, well, I'm going to get me one, and uh, you know, something pep me up. And need to drink a little bit so I can eat. You know, that uh, always is a good excuse. And I could, I could eat. Give me about three drinks, him, and I could eat. Now go beyond that, forget about food. You know. And so forth, uh, but uh, but anyway, that went on for for years, and and uh, but what was happening during this time that, that you know I was picking up more DWIs, I was losing my, I'm hard headed, I, you know I'm really, uh, and, and you might want to call it, it probably it's just easier to call it stupid, but at one of those DWIs, it was on a Sunday night. I tried to be good, and it seemed like it was after Thanksgiving that year. And some way or another, what I'd, uh, I'd gotten, a, you know, I'd take truck trips every once in a while. A lot of my buddies drove trucks, and sometimes I'd drive, you know, they'd, <laughs> they'd get peeled up, and I'd get behind the wheel, and then uh, some of you people know uh, Mr. LGD Witt up in the, in the elevator area, and he had, uh, he had two different truck lines, textile, uh, and, uh, and uh, what was that, LGD Witt uh, truck. But anyway, and, and, and but that's a side point. <laughs> but, but anyway, I'd go on these truck trips every once in a while just to get away. And, and I knew that some of these guys, I, I wasn't going to be able to drink. I remember being in New York one time, and, and, and I knew that guy, and I had enough respect for him to not, because he, he, he drank, but, but he drank when it was appropriate to drink. And he had enough respect for the man he drove for that you were not going to have alcohol in his truck. Now, he let me get in his tr truck drunk, but I didn't have any alcohol. And I was up in Syracuse, New York. But that afternoon, there was uh, sun hitting that windshield in Virginia, and that alcohol wearing off me. And I, you know, I, I was scared to tell him to stop and let me get out and let me go back. And, and I climbed back in that sleeper, <laughs> and God knows. And the next thing I know, it's snowing, and, and uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to die. Because I, did, I literally thought I was going to die, and, and the crazy and insane stuff was what he's going to do with my body. Will they let me lay back here, and they bring me, you know, just ignore me? Will they get an ambulance to bring, you know, a, a funeral home ambulance and take the body? I really didn't know what was going to happen. But, but just stupid, crazy stuff like this. But one time I'd went to, I think it was Florida. But anyway, I got back into town, and that Sunday I couldn't wait to get back and... and, 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 and Nationally, you know, in South Carolina, well, anywhere you at, there ain't no problem getting liquor, even though it's dry. Scotland County was dry, but, 
You know, I, I did most of my drinking in South Carolina, bootleggers. But anyway, I got good and drunk that Sunday afternoon and went downtown and showed myself, and then I left. And then I went back. And again, a little old community, North Carolina. The policeman there, Emerson Cottingham, he's dead. I was able to make amends to him and, uh, prior, to, prior to his death. But, but, uh, and he was a good man, you know, and he, he could lock me up a lot. But, but uh, I didn't like it when he did, but he could have a lot of other times. But anyway, he, uh, he was sitting there at the service station, he had a little office there, and he saw me when I pulled in, and he called over there and he, to he told the guys that so, said, tell Harold not to leave here driving tonight, that if he does, he's going to be locked up. And they told me. Now you can call this insane, you can call it stupid, you can call it hard headed, whatever, it's sort of stupid, really. I told him, yeah, I said, y'all are lying. I said, I'll show you. I said, he ain't going to lock me up. I said, I'm, I, I, I'm, I want to turn around, I'm going right back down the street, right into South Carolina, headed on. He was sitting in his car. <laughs> Threw my hand up at him. <laughs> Fifteen seconds later, I'm talking to him. <laughs> a minute later, <laughs> he didn't handcuff me, but I went to Lawrenburg, locked up. DW, you know, and stupid, crazy, insane. And by this time, it wasn't getting them changed to uh, careless and reckless like some of them had done and things such as this. But this is just, you know, my drinking, the hard-headedness and sanity of it and, and stuff such as this. And, and, uh, and all I went up down to Georgia and, you know, uh, on a construction job down there, we're down there a couple of years, wound up with a wife, and then next to uh, my daughter, she was born down there. And, and you know, again, I'm thinking, hey, you know, you got a wife, it, 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 nothing changed, just drank more at home, you know? And, and then, then you got, you know, your crazy insane stuff in that marriage. I mean, uh, I remember a cousin come through, just, just, he just stopped to visit. And he was going through a divorce down in Florida, you know, so we drank some of that crying liquor that night. <laughs> and the next day, we worked four tens and we were going to get paid, uh, you know, on the on construction job. And so I got him to take me to work. And it, it, crazy, insane stuff out there on the construction site that morning because, you know, I didn't go to work. I wouldn't, we got, wouldn't drink more liquor, but I would need to go get my check. And the next thing I know, here we are, and this is back in the time that uh, in the 70s when CBs were popular. Everybody had CBs, you know, and, and, and so forth. And I remember I decided I was going to go to Charlotte with him and spend the weekend. I, and I hadn't talked, I hadn't left. My wife saw me that morning leave with a hard hat on my head and my lunchbox. She made me a lunch, and I left with a hard hat on my head and lunchbox going to work. But needless to say, uh, late that afternoon, I decided I'm going to Charlotte with him. And uh, I remember between uh, Macon, Georgia, and Atlanta, Interstate 75. I'm driving this little duster he's got, and I think by this time he's passed out in the back seat. But, and I'm driving wide open. And I mean, it'd probably run 95 wide open. And every once in a while I'd have to hit brakes or something, you just run up on lights, you know, and you hit the brakes, and he falls the seat back there, and he raises up, he says, you know, the law's gonna get us. And I remember consciously thinking, I hope they do. Because I needed to be stopped. I mean, that was a conscious thought. But, you know, and, and he said, somebody on the CB is going to call. I said, let them call. The next thing I know is, on, you know, come to the next morning on the other side of the land. The next thing I know is I'm here in Charlotte. And that afternoon, his father finally got up with us. <laughs> and there had been some communication between his father, my uncle, and my wife in Georgia. And it was decided I need to get on a plane going back. <laughs> And that was a, I got one drink on the plane flying back, and they, they said no more, you know. <laughs> it, uh, anyway, that's a story itself, and, and, and getting through uh, the airport and the blackout in Atlanta. But I got, you know, I got back to Bacon. But anyway, just all kind of crazy stuff, but thinking that things are going to change because I got a wife and I got a child. Things didn't change. Insanity, just stupid, really. I, I remember my daughter just a, just a, infant and, and going to the state fair, it was there in Macon and, and had one of my old buggies and, and, and me keeping my liquor hid up under the thing of that and just got drunker and drunker and just made uh, just crazy stuff out there at the fair and, and just on and on and on, just insane. 
And, and time rolled on, and, and, and the next thing you know, I got, I got three kids. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a father. Uh, all I know how to do is, is, is drink. And uh, what happened was, I, in 1977, I went to uh, I called, made a phone call one Sunday afternoon, and I was 12 step by uh, Herb C., who was still still living. I had breakfast with him here. A lot of you know Herb from, he lives up in Webster Salem now, but he was, he was living in Hamlet at that time. And he and Liston Mulligan, 12 step me that Sunday evening, and, and uh, took me to a meeting, brought me over to the Wilder building on a Tuesday night. Uh, and that was my first AA meeting. It was October 77. I don't remember the date or anything else. And uh, that Wednesday night, I was back in Rockingham, picked up a white chip. Went to meetings for a year. Uh, didn't get a sponsor. Read a big book. I read that right off the bat. That 24-hour day book. Read it every day religiously. Uh, raised up in Methodist Church. They scattered there. And, you know, they're talking. Yeah, you know, I don't have no problem with it. Uh, and I just went to meetings and didn't drink for a year. Things were better because, my God, you know, the way I was messing up drinking and all, it had to be better. But what I didn't realize on the inside, nothing changed. You know, nothing changed. And again, here I am back trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players. Uh, I wanted to be liked. I wanted to be, I wanted to be needed. I wanted, I wanted all of these things. And, and, and I really had no idea what I wanted. Uh, and what happened was I graduated from that guy. I quit going to meetings. I, uh, I didn't have time. I'd gone in, I, had a, I had a masonry business. Now I bought a country store, you know, going to go places twice or fast and stuff such as that. Quit going to meetings and, and, uh, and went another probably 18 months and didn't drink. Now what I did do is I drank a lot of NyQuil uh, for a period of time there. <laughs> And all I can tell you is expensive drinking, you know. And I knew exactly what I was drinking for. I was drinking because it was 25 percent alcohol, you know, that uh, <laughs> 50 proof booze. That uh, you know, and I knew what I was drinking for. I was even I had to save some for in the mornings, you know, to sort of wake up on and stuff such as this. Uh, and people, people really did, again, this little community, people that had seen me and the insanity of my drinking and and all these kind of things and and, and so forth. Uh, would make comments. Some knew I was going to AA, some didn't know I was going to AA, but they didn't know uh, that I was no longer drinking. That was pretty evident, because when I drank, people knew it. There was no doubt about that. I, I made sure they knew it. Uh, uh, but what happened was uh, they would make comments, you know, we're proud of you. Uh, they would even say, Mylon, this is my adopted mother, and she would really be proud of you, and things such as this. And I remember thinking that when they would make those comments, if you only knew, if you only knew what I had in here. <laughs> I knew there was a monster in here. Now what I didn't realize was the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous was designed to clean that out. And see what, you know, basically pretty well what I shared with you, not what I remember, most of my drinking was blackout. I don't remember, thank God for them, that uh, I don't think I could have dealt with it if I'd had to remember all of it. But, but all that stuff, all that stuff prior to ever putting alcohol and numbing and sedating the internal part of me and, and that was in there and so forth. So uh, here I am. I'm not going to meetings. I, you know, I, I, I'm not, yeah, by this time, I, I think I'd given my uncle the big book. And I'd put the 24-hour uh, uh, day book because I'd already read through it one time anyway. So, you know, <laughs> I'd miss that one day at a time concept. And, and, and this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, like I say, life miserable. Another wife got three kids. I, had. I still don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a. And, and, and it's just, just a mess. And uh, finally, it reached a point where I couldn't take it any longer. And I drank again. It was in June of uh, 1980. And I remember well. Uh, starting back drinking. And it started back with spirits of ammonia. That's a little brown ball. And it goes way back. But. The, I'd use many bottles of it detoxing, but I never used it to get on my drunk. And drank two that night with Coca Cola and went to the bootleggers in South Carolina again. Woke them up, <laughs> told them what I needed, and they said, Oh my God, said Lauren's getting on another drunk. They were talking about my uncle. I said, No, nah, this is for me. And they looked at me and they said, Harold, please don't start back. I said, You've been doing so good. I said, Please don't start back. And I looked at him, I told him, I said, I've got to. And that was the truth, I had to. You know, I don't think I could wait much longer without drinking. And I lay drunk for three days. 
came to my senses and I said, boy, they were right, Program of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, that, uh, that this thing's progressive. Because prior to that, I used to, you know, I could drink and work the next day. But I lay drunk three days. I, I, they got me to the job, but I couldn't work. Uh, and that was, a, that was a story in itself. Uh, but anyway, uh, I decided I wasn't going to drink again. I didn't think about, well, I need to call somebody in the AA to go back. Uh, and you know what happened. In a day or two, I was slipping here, there, and everybody, everywhere else. I didn't want nobody to know I was drinking, trying to hide it. And, and again, I stayed drunk pretty well eight months. Last two weeks of that was uh, I abandoned my family. I wound up in Florida. You know, you're talking about the crazy and insanity of the family, and you know it is a family illness and, and uh, so forth. And I've got, a, uh, biologically, i got a brother and a sister, and, and, and by being adopted, I have a half-sister uh, uh, still living. And, and, uh, but, uh, and, and this biological sister, back when I disappeared, she was trying to get my biological brother. This was, this is how crazy families get. Because of you, you know, she, my brother pretty well had an idea where I was at. Well, he didn't have an idea where I was at, but he wasn't worried about me because he knew I always showed back up, or you know, that I was just drunk somewhere. Now he'd he'd rescued me quite a few times, but I was in Florida, and he got wind of it. That, that's he understood that's where I was headed, me and another boy. But, but anyway, this sister of mine, and she's probably, she's probably about 12 years older than I am. But anyway, she, uh, she was wanting to get my picture put on a darn milk carton. Now, <laughs> and, and, and this ain't insane, you know. I'm thinking, when I got back, I was, <laughs> they was telling me that. And I said, dang. But, and, and God bless her. Thank you, thank you for you know, having that sister. I mean, I'm sure she never smoked a cigarette. She never took too much whiskey or anything. I, I'm sure of that. It was beyond a shadow of a doubt. And she used to never condemn me, put me down or anything else. She'd just say, I'm going to pray for you. And thank God she did. I mean, but, but it put my picture on a milk cart. It ain't just something. But anyway, that's, that's how crazy the family gets. Now, uh, what happened was I wound up in, in, in February of 81 at Samaritan Colony. And I, I didn't intend to, you know, I didn't intend to stay there. <laughs> I was, I, you know, I'd always been good again, figuring out how to get out of the mess I was in. I was, and I was in a mess this time, you know, because I'd abandoned that family. I wasn't welcome to go back to this home, man. It was my old home place where I was raised up, and that was my wife and those three kids were at, But I wasn't welcome to go back there, and I knew that. Um, but, but give me a few days. I figured it out. She brought my clothes up there, because when I went to Florida, I was down there two weeks and just had what I had on. <laughs> That's another story itself. But anyway, you're having to do laundry, you ain't going to have to do what you got on. Because you ain't going to spend no money on no clothes. That's the last thing you're going to spend money on. But, but, uh, but anyway, uh, I needed to figure out, or who, who could I figure out to get me out of the mess? I'm always good at that. I could use other people. And um, it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. I, you know, I tell people I'm still there. <laughs> You know, on a part-time basis now, but I undoubtedly hadn't figured that thing out yet how to get away from here. But uh, what did happen was after uh, probably about 10 days, I was powerless when I went there. Man, I was whipped. I was beat. But on a Wednesday night, boy, the power returned, and, and, and they had a song service there at that time. And, and that Wednesday night, if I'd had a fifth of liquor, boy, I could have killed it. And the reason I could because a, a, a young man... Uh, uh, about 10 years old, and he'd come to visit me, he and he, with his family that night. And he sat next to me back on that back row, and he liked like he was just as happy as he could to be with me. Now, he was a guy, a little kid I'd taken time up with the store, you know, and, and, and so forth, but he was, he was just uh, overjoyed to be there with me, and I, and I, I, that just killed me, you know, I thought, boy, you just don't know, just really. Because I did, I had, you know, I, I was, the alcohol was gone enough that, that I, I knew that I was just filth. And that, uh, that why would he be happy to see me? And of course, his family brought me. They they'd come to visit, and and that family, I you know, I I I'd screwed their father on that store deal and everything. And eventually, was able to sell it, and and I don't know where we ever got straight. I mean, where he got what he deserved out of it or not. But but again, people that would try to help me gave me all kind of opportunities and everything else, and I wound up, you know, because of my alcoholism screwing them. But anyway, they were there visiting me, and the next day I, I stayed in the classroom after, uh, after class that day, right before lunch, and, and Mac Willingham, he was the director there, he was chaplain at that time, and, and, 
And he told me a few things about myself, and, and I, you know, I, I sort of took him with a grain of salt. It wasn't bad. But he said, wrestle with him. This was on a Thursday, and he said, uh, you want to talk about him come Monday? He said, uh, you knock on my door back there. And my thinking was probably something like this, was probably that I won't be here Monday. But uh, anyway, I did what he said, and I remember well after lunch that day uh, knocking on the door. And I, I went back. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knocked on that door. And I went in, and, and what happened was I sat down on a rocking chair, and, 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 and I sat there, and what I realized today was that uh, I shared with another human being some of that stuff, some of that stuff that was on the inside. Now, I'd shared a lot of stuff in my life, but it was a bunch of lies, deceits, uh, anything to make me look good, that, you know, selfishness, self-centeredness, that was me from the get-go. It described me from the very get-go. And when I did that inventory, when I put that stuff on paper and everything, wrote it out like a biography, and, 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 and most, of my, most of my life was, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, selfishness, self-centeredness was, was the root of all of it. It didn't matter whether it was jealousy. It didn't, you know, it was all about what I could get, what I needed, you know, and things such as this, as I shared with you. It seemed like that uh, if I could have did that when I was 15 years old, I, you know, I could have saved a lot of money, <laughs> you know, because I probably would have been no need to drink. But, but anyway, and thank God that I did find alcohol, because if I hadn't found it, I wouldn't have made it anyway either. So, uh, But anyway, as a result of that, I opened these doors and shared with another human being a little bit what was in here. And what happened after that, I found the courage and, and, uh, and uh, uh, to stay and to do what was asked of me and do that fourth step. And, and, and what happened was I, you know, you know, opened these doors completely and shared with another human being. Another human being over a period of time, the insanity and the crazy of my life and the hurt and the deceit and the lies and the dishonesty and all that that had made up who I was and, and, and so forth. And, and what happened was, uh, some of you heard me say this uh, before, but uh, a few weeks or no, a couple of months prior to winding up at Samaritan Colony, this guy by the name of Willie Cook, and Willie was a big black guy, and he was a muscular guy, and he was retired, and he was a, a part-time minister, and he had uh, had a, a sang in a gospel group and everything, and he was a good man. I'd known him since childhood, and I used to see him walk down the town of, of Gibson, and, and when he walked, it was like pushing them old buggies, because he used to push buggies with 200-pound fertilizer, ba fertilizer bags on at uh, Laurenburg, uh, over in Laurenburg at the Dixie, go out a fertilizer plant. And, and he was just, he wasn't from lifting weights, he was just muscular. And he'd been working with me on a part-time basis and helping me, and my life was a total shambles. But I remember well on a Saturday morning, and I could nearby show you the spot at my old home place where he, 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 he told me when I was going there, uh, as we was pulling in, he said, Harold, he said, I don't know what all is going on with you, but he said, I'm going to tell you one thing, you need God in your life. And I could have killed Willie that morning. I believe I, shot, I had a pistol, I just shot him. But, uh, you know, I didn't say anything because I wasn't talking a lot, man. And, uh, and Willie was so right. But what, what I needed was a relationship with God. And, and what happened when I got all this stuff out of me, I think the, I think the sunlight of the Spirit could start to shine in a little bit. And as a result, result of that, 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 I started to develop a relationship with God. And, and that's what's happened through the years. And, 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 you know, as I say, as I said when I got up here, God, as I understand, I don't really understand a lot about God. But I don't really understand, really don't understand how this, this thing here works and what you do with that to get it on uh, whatever you do where you can listen to it, however you listen to it. But, but I don't even understand on Sunday afternoons, you know, the remote. I have a basic idea. I know you've got to put it in the direction of the TV, you know, you can't shoot it back this way. I have done it the other side sometimes, just playing with it. Sometimes it'll work. I don't know what it beams over. Or <laughs> but, you know, I don't really understand. That, that Saturday back in, 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 in uh, February, of, I mean, yeah, March of 1957 when they put that TV in our house, black and white deal, big something. They went up on the top put the antenna. They said things come through airways. I remember looking at that, going outside trying to see if I could see little cartoon characters running there or something. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I wanted to know. And, and, and I didn't, but anyway, it's remote. I don't understand that today. But I tell you one thing, I sure do enjoy it on Saturday, uh, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, whenever, you know, and watching a race take place live out in Texas or somewhere, and then there's a good football game on another channel, and, you know, I don't understand it, but I can do what I can appreciate. 
And that's the way it is with God. I don't the magnitude of God and so forth. A God that I really don't understand, but a God to have a relationship with, and a God I can experience. I don't have to understand it to experience it and have appreciation for it, you know. And 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 sometimes even at night, there's nothing on TV, and you got about 900 channels, and you just hit that thing, boom, 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 boom. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and I don't have to understand all that, but I can, you know, I can appreciate just going through all of them and then say, well, I'm going to bed, you know, because there ain't nothing there. But but uh, what has happened is is the experience with God and being able to experience God and to know that I have been totally blessed in my life is beyond expectations and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and for that I am, I'm deeply, deeply grateful. I'm deeply grateful to Brad for the kind words when I, um, prior to getting up here. I'm grateful for so many, all, all of you, I'm grateful for you and so many of you have a pretty neat relationship through the years. Again, thank you for being a primary purpose group. It's, it's uh, always, uh, when I hear people talk about primary purpose group, I always, feel good because, uh, you know, when I'm here, I'm, I feel like I'm part of it. I hear people say that, uh, that uh, you know, their home groups, uh, most in the, what, what is it, just, what do these people say, the best group there is or something, and uh, and I don't say that. I think this is the best group because I'm here tonight. Not because I'm here, but because we're here together because this is where I'm at tonight. Now, if you'd have caught me in Rockingham last night at the Old Time Structure Group, I'd have said that was the best group because that's where I was at. But, uh, but again, thank you for allowing me to be here with you tonight. And I know I've rambled and whatever, and, and it, uh, I haven't seen that thing take a picture yet. But anyway, <laughs> thanks a lot, and I love all of you.